Well, let's start by talking about Mark as a video maker. I think he's unique, uh, and I and for my taste, I think he's the best of, the best in the world. He really is about doing videos that support the artist and finding the soul of the artist and the soul of the song and amplifying those, taking them to an extreme that the song itself or the artist themselves rarely can reach this pinnacle moment. I had a knack for this for some reason from the get-go and I went like, I love, I like this idea because I really like movies and I really like pop music and they're pretty much the two most important things in my life and wow, I, I might actually, I could have a job where I get to put those two thing, things together, it's like the greatest thing ever. This is somebody who knows how to, knows how to shoot and understands light and composition. He finds those singular images that really stand out and really create a lasting impression. They are very, very beautifully made pieces. His video always reached perfection. You know, I always really loved his videos. He's such a perfectionist. But he has a reputation as being a perfectionist. He's a perfectionist. He's a perfectionist. He's a perfectionist. We definitely agree on the fact that he is a very precise man. You know, that's the thing people look at him as a stylist and a visual sort of auteur type. But he really doesn't know that much about cameras. I mean, that's the irony of it. He actually, you know, doesn't touch the camera. He won't touch the camera ever. Well, filmmaking is this weird combination for me of rigor and planning and uh, thinking things out in advance so that the process of filming can allow accidents to happen and things that you wouldn't have actually planned for or thought of. He's just really working out every detail and just, you know, consummate in what he was doing. The weird thing about Mark is you, you know that it's going to be great. He consistently does great work, one after another. Whether you like the artist or not, the video will be fantastic. I really committed myself to it. I always really wanted to be a feature film director, but that wasn't coming together, so I said, well, maybe if I just do this and really focus on it, I'll learn more about myself as a person and might have more stories to tell and be able to just grow as a human being and, and be ready to make a movie because I might know a thing or two and really learn the craft, you know, by getting to do all these different aesthetics. I can learn how to do a science fiction look or I can do like a hand crank look or I can do like a period thing. And I just really embraced it and tried to get really good at it. You know, I think the hallmark of his work is not how, it's, it's how compositions work together, how things build on other things, how pictures and placement of people builds on the placement of the thing that came before it. Mark's very different than most uh, directors I work with. His, a lot has to do with the meticulous preparation. A lot of people don't go to the extent that he does to prepare for a job. So when you go there, you kind of know what you're going for. At that early stage of my career, which is probably only about three years into my career of making music videos in earnest, to have an opportunity to work with David Bowie is very intimidating. That was a great job for me. It was at the beginning of my career, and it was like this building process and this process of trust. And for me, it was fantastic because I felt this freedom to be creative that I hadn't really felt before. It was a time in the early 90s where I was using the music video as a sketch pad to see what aesthetic suited me. I just sort of took the stuff that I was like turned on by at that moment, like Alphaville and La Jete and um, Orson Welles' The Trial, Jacques Tati's Playtime. So this was this Cuisinart of references. You know, we all appropriate things from, from what we've seen before. And the key, I think, is knowing what to appropriate and then how to, how to use it. You hope that you can take someone else's stuff and to apply it to this piece of music and, and digest it through your own system and you kind of get this new thing. Actually, that's one of my favorite all-time videos, especially the, the shot of um, Bowie balancing on the roof. There's something about that that I really like. I like being able to focus on a single icon, you know, even in the Lenny Kravitz video, it's a performance video, but you can, you know, there's this incredible icon that you can 
be, that can be the nucleus of what you're doing. When I heard Are You Gonna Go My Way before I saw the video, I liked the song, but I didn't love it. And then I saw the video, and it made me love the song. Up until that point, things were growing. But when that video hit, and that song hit, my life changed. It was an iconic look. It didn't look like anything else. People hoped that it was a real place that they could go to, or a club or something, but it's, um, it, was, it's, it was a set. It was built in the uh, Olympic Auditorium downtown LA because we couldn't really find a soundstage that was high enough. I wept as I saw them break it down. It was built for the day and torn down. That was it. You know, I, this is when I first started to get to know Spike Jones, and he came by the set and took a bunch of photographs and hung out. And this is the first time that Spike had hung out on one of my sets, and uh, the set was really a cool place to hang out. Just the whole thing fit. It, it, it looked classy, and it looked timeless, and that's important for me. It's really the quintessential rock video. I think that video highlights Mark's ability to take a song and an artist and lift them with his vision. That video made Lenny Kravitz a worldwide superstar. And every time Lenny gets laid and he's about to come, he just starts screaming, Mark Ravick! This is true. It's so odd in a format driven by performance videos for one performance video to supersede all others. And Are You Gonna Go My Way does that. I remember there was one that I hated, and that was the Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson one. I hate that fucking video. When Sony had asked me to uh, actually choose the director for the, the video, I mean, it was just hands down Mark Romanek. There was a sense that this is a historic moment in pop culture history that Janet and Michael are going to do a video together. And they wanted it to be big. And they needed the video in something like seven weeks. And it took like two weeks to just plan it. And it took two weeks to shoot it. So I couldn't really, I just had to build it big. It was the only way to get it done. So I got on the phone with the head of the record label. And he had seen the budget and was apoplectic. And he started screaming at me on the speakerphone. You know, do you think I'm the fucking Bank of America? Are you out of your fucking mind? And I said, well, you know, Michael and Janet want something huge. You've given me no time to do it. The song brings to mind images of a spaceship. And if Michael Jackson has his own spaceship, it's going to be really impressive. And there was this dead silence on the speakerphone. And then I heard, yeah, that's right. And I realized that Michael was in the room on the other end of the line, which I didn't know. And from that moment, the, the record executive guy knew that he was pretty much screwed. It was only supposed to be, a, if I can remember, a, a three-day shoot, and it turned into like a week. There was a lot of press around us all the time. There was a lot of publicity. One of the, the craziest things I remember was coming back from lunch on like the third day, and as I walked onto the set, I was hushed by one of the producers who said, you have to be quiet, Michael's on stage. And I, I went around the corner and I saw Michael Jackson, Grandpa Munster, and I think three or four of the last living munchkins all doing this weird dance. This video is in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's the most expensive music video ever made. And that is not true. There is another music video that cost millions of dollars more. And I always found that an incredibly dubious distinction. I'd like to be thought of as a really good music video director, not this profligate psycho. Because I really hate that. It's the most expensive video ever made. Well, look. I gravitate toward the, the directors that I really fall in love with. And I wanted Mark to, to direct God till it's gone. John had played me this track with this Joni Mitchell sample, which was I thought a really cool idea, big Joni Mitchell fan, big Joni Mitchell fan. And um, once again, it was a situation of like, what was I being, what was I into at that time? And I was really into this magazine that was popular in South Africa called Drum Magazine. I guess it was sort of like the life magazine of a township. And the photography was stunning. And I said, 
you know, I would like to make a video that depicted black culture that wasn't so obsessed as a lot of the hip hop videos were in that period and still are with less materialism and sexism. And I just felt like there's gotta be other aspects of black culture to depict. From the time video began till well, well into the late 80s, there was a monstrous image of females being perpetrated without much exception. In the face of that, I found this video to be full of humanity. Janet herself was lovely, but, but it had dignity and it was full of life. But Mark's work is always like that, and I'm not trying to lick his butt or anything, but it's just the truth. His work is like that. He is just, he's amazing. At that point, I, I was, you know, felt really confident about what 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 I could do, and I, but mainly because at that point, I'd surrounded myself with so many amazing collaborators, and you know, if you have someone like Harris Savita shooting and Robert Duffy cutting and Tom Foden designing your sets or Jeff Cronenweth shooting your stuff, I mean, it's like it's pretty hard to fuck it up. So y that emboldens you to go, wow, well, let's try something really daring here. This whole idea of of somehow taking the aesthetic of snapshot photography and exploring it in, as cinema, as in motion. And you know, one of those things you see is the, the, that red eye effect that people usually want to get rid of. And I thought, well, let's put it in the video. Bad, bad the challenge of creating a snapshot look on film was interesting and something that Harris Savitas, the cinematographer and I, uh, got excited by, like how do we make it look like a flash had just gone off. And the only way to achieve that was by having a very small source of light. So we did some experimenting and made the smallest light I've ever seen. And it looked really thrilling. It just, the look of it was sort of a 180 from how you're supposed to light something. I mean, it's just so dumb. It's like. I thought I looked really pretty. And I saw the part of me in the pool and I was like, that's the prettiest picture. I look so pretty. And I thought, yeah, that's a, that's a real video. That's a real video, and, and I can't wait till everybody sees it. What was really unique about Fiona at that time was she was the first, you know, female song, singer-songwriter who was, you know, astonishingly young to be writing these sophisticated and mature lyrics. And I was really concerned at the time that she understood that, that we wanted to do something provocative that she, that she was okay with it. I pulled out a lot of photo references of the level and the degree of eroticism and, and uh, sexuality that I thought might be inter interesting to portray and I showed it to her and I said, this is the kind of stuff that I think would be interesting to do. Are you okay with this? And she was fine with it. The song was really about feeling bad for getting something so easily and taking advantage of you know, your sexuality and just using it to get whatever you want which ended up working with the video because it was a sexual video and I got exactly what I had wanted. But then I didn't feel good. I actually did feel like a criminal after that. She made some comments in some interviews that she felt kind of coerced or that she didn't really have the ability to say no because I had a reputation as a, as a, a big video director. It was nothing against Mark and it was nothing against the art of the video. I got so much shit for it. You know, all the people that are there during the video telling you how great it is, they're not there anymore. So then you have all these people that are there going, you sell out, you slut, you, ha you know. Very confusing, but, you know, it's cool to talk about. I think she's come around to see the qualities of it and the intention of it was not meant to be strictly prurient. It was meant to be provocative and talked about, but intelligent. It was beautiful. It's a good video. It looks, it looks really good. Um, it works for the song. It's not. Uh, uh, we can be friends again. <laughs> um, no, I think it's beautiful. You know, the thing about music videos is that there's like no rules. So I like to actually impose artificial rules on myself. Uh, on the Fiona Apple video, I said I'm only going to light it with this one little cheap hardware store light on top of the lens. And, or the idea of shooting a whole music video on a silent hand crank movie camera. And uh, you know, on the Mick Jagger God Gave Me video, I said I want to put a body camera rig on Mick Jagger and never have a shot without it. Usually when you see that in a film, 
when the camera's attached to the person, it's always like a close-up, like a head and shoulder shot, and I really wanted to get a wider shot. The way we accomplished that was we built almost like a, a, a lightweight kayak that was weighted in the back so it could stretch out farther. I'd heard about this body harness, but I didn't think that it was as heavy and as debilitating as it ended up being. I would never have expected Mick Jagger to strap that friggin' thing on and do that for however many days. Any turn I made, I had to make it look like I wasn't like navigating this rig. And it did feel a little bit awkward, but then like I start, you just start get, you get used to it after like a couple minutes. After the first five minutes, I was like, Mark, you gotta be kidding me. You know, I nearly broke my back in that video, but you don't mind doing it for Mark. Probably because of this video is maybe the only reason anyone's ever heard of us. <laughs> you know, still, most people have never even heard of the eels, I think. I almost went to the bathroom in my pants at one point when I was up on that street lamp. I might have actually have done it a little bit, and it was, I think, I think the crew could tell. I got hit by a car. <laughs> I was supposed to do that thing where, you know, I'm walking here, I'm walking, and I'm supposed to jump out of the way, but the brakes didn't work. It was an old car, and it ended up hitting me and messed up my leg. I just remember sitting in the tub and having the feet there, and trying not to have them really actually touch me. <laughs> there was one scene where I'm on the buoy and the camera actually was, it was on a crane and it felt it was going to fall into the ocean and then I see. I love the three-legged dog. He could get around the three legs. I'm thinking of chopping this one's leg off just to, uh, only kidding, Raz. I think Mark came up with the idea of having a, a light that said Weezer in red letters, but he reversed a few of the letters, so it said We're Rez. I remember thinking, no, <laughs> but uh, it stayed, and then, and then I think our fans really picked up on that. And you'll see they they make their own bootleg shirts that say Weirez on it. So that uh, I guess that turned out to be a really good idea. <laughs> I think I really torture people. I think I put people really through hell to make these videos, but. You know, I guess I want them to be really good, and to do something really good usually requires this extra effort. I remember Rick Rubin telling me about Mark. He said, he goes, look, whatever the treatment is, don't fucking worry about it. Just work with him and it's gonna be great. I had um, seen these photo art pieces by Erwin Worm and knew that they were, it was a great idea for a music video, but you really needed just the perfect band. All of these different people were sending treatments and there's this one treatment that was these, you know, very magical looking fax images of sculptures. You know, the Chili Peppers are kind of knuckleheads in, a, in the most artistic sense of that word. You looked at those images of, the, of this Worm guy and it just, they were so cool. Well, first of all, I should say we contacted Erwin Worm and we said, we're thinking of taking your concept and apply it to a Red Hot Chili Peppers video, and he really liked that idea. So we did have his total blessing, and we made like tables and tables of stuff. What I did is I shot the specific ideas and then always left one take afterwards to just do whatever you want and impro improvise. There was a little bit of strife at the beginning because I had never worked with John, who I really think is a genius, but he's, a, he's a sort of a sensitive soul. John, our guitar player, and Mark got into an instant clash. I, I yell, I don't yell in anger, but I like, I kind of in the middle of a take, I'll say, okay, start again, okay, go, go back, but this time do it in your left hand, you know, I just yell a lot. And John was like, fuck this guy, he's a fucking asshole, I'm out of here, I'm not gonna stand here and take this abuse, I'm gone. Which was uh, absurd. But it, it actually ended up being great, and after a couple hours, we got into a, a rhythm, and um, he actually sent me a beautiful note thanking me for the video and um, how he felt like it captured a certain quality in performance that he had never seen on film before. We looked at that stage when we first saw it and we're like, uh, Mark, we, we can't perform on that stage, it's, it's far too small. What does one say to them at that point, like we can't go out and make it bigger? It's like, well, it's really, it's really well set up for the light, so we, we, we think that you might want to... And eventually we worked with the space and we realized it was actually a great advantage to have some confines because it sort of changed to what we were used to doing. Something could feel limited or awkward, but if it works for the camera, that's really all that matters. The band's subjective experience of it isn't strictly that important. It's nice if they have a good time. It's better to have a good time than not to have a good time. But it's all really about 
what the camera's getting, what's what's going in through that little aperture there. He did not, he was, wasn't gonna babysit us, he wasn't gonna like wait till we were in the right mood. He knew what he wanted, he was gonna ask us to do it, and if we weren't gonna do it, uh, you know. <laughs> He's just like, you know, let's just, you know, do it. He's a very demanding director, you know, he knows exactly what he wants. He gets things organized fast, he doesn't fuck around on the set. He seems to be pretty intuitive about the whole directing process. He watches, he gets very emotional, Screams at you, screams at the camera people, screams at anyone that'll within an earshot. Mark got upset a couple of times, but that's Mark. We were literally hiding from Mark at the side of the stage. If you didn't like something, you didn't wonder if he didn't like it or not. You pretty much knew for sure that he didn't like that. He wants it right. I've seen him go off. Something happened when one of the lighting rigs wasn't working. He, was, he had his megaphone, and he's just, fuck, and he like threw it and it broke, and then all of us in the band were just like, yes. He's scary. I don't, I don't want to tell this, this guy's business, but he, he he loves it so much. You know what I'm saying? I just remember one time it was a police grown man, and he kept doing something wrong, you know. But we was losing the sun, and he just screams out of nowhere. Look at all the I said, is that Mark? It's my job to how to be the. the the, the prick that has to keep pushing them, and they get mad at me sometimes, but this is the only time we're going to capture this. You know, you can rest later. This is forever on the film, and I think when they see the finished video, they understand. Can't stop the spirits when they need you. Mark seems to bring ideas to the table, whether they're sort of narrative ideas or they're visual ideas. He's sort of, or, he's, he's, he's brought something to the table that he wants to sort of, uh, explore. It's hard to find a new angle on a guy singing passionately into a microphone. It's hard to find a new fresh angle on a guy hitting a cymbal. But you do, you know, you do what you can. I mean, I think unlike the faint Linkin Park video, that was a nice twist on performance where you're seeing them from behind in silhouette. His treatment was basically, um, he wanted to convey the energy of the song through silhouettes and movement. So two thirds of the video, you don't even see our faces. Anyone watching the video is probably going to say, well, when are we going to see their faces? And so I thought that would engage a viewer in a different way where it starts to become like, well, what's going on here? Are we going to be behind them the whole time? In performance videos, there's, there's often this sense of just um, waiting for them to finish the song. And here you've just got a very clean sort of visual structure to the video. And when that switch happens to the other side, you're really ready for it. And it really lifts the video into a, in, into a sort of new place. At the time, that was sort of a risk because with Music videos, you know, one of the basic things is show who the band is, show what they are. But for us, it's more about the emotion and energy that's being put out there. And uh, I think he, he just did a great job at showing that. I think over the course of a career, you really learn that, especially with rock music, or really anything, frankly, that it's all about energy. It's all about, obviously you can push something too far, but with, it's a rock video, it's not Pinter. You know, you're not looking for subtlety, you're trying to grab people by the collar, usually. So over the course of my career, I would look at it and go, God, I wish that had more energy. And you get on the set and you ask for more energy than on your next video, and then you get into the editing room and go, well, it's better, but I wish that had even more energy there. Mark's instructions were very simple. He said, you know, like, take the most energetic performance of your two-hour show and do nothing but that for the four minutes of the song. We did a fireworks test the night before to see the show, and the, the, the location was cleared by the film commission, but it didn't, just didn't occur to anyone how loud this was going to be. And the San Fernando Police Department received many calls from concerned citizens that there was a terrorist attack happening in, in the valley. So they were going to shut us down, so then we had to start negotiating. Well, you can't shut us down. We've built the scaffolding, we've built this construction elevator, we've set up you know, this incredible fireworks display, we have to shoot. So they said, okay, well, you can shoot from sundown to 10.30. We had to shoot the video in a two-day period, and we only had, I believe, the license to, sh to blow off the fireworks maybe six or eight times between the two nights. We originally had five crews on top of the scaffolding. We decided, well, let's make it seven, because we, we were just not going to get enough takes. The scaffolding was not rigid. It was still swaying about 10 inches at the top. 
the scaffolding of the band at the time was maybe a little shakier than the scaffolding of the video. And sometimes the fireworks didn't work. All of the fireworks in front of the band failed to go off during one of the takes. It was also alternatingly freezing cold. And then when the fireworks would go off, Brad, who was playing shirtless, was singed and scarred. We were told by the film commission, and this is no exaggeration because they told us this, that there were 500 calls to police stations and fire stations and everywhere, they thought it was a war going on. Is it a terrorist attack or is it a video shoot? I just couldn't believe the explosions. I mean, I couldn't believe it. This is one, it's like a simple idea. I went, wouldn't it be cool if a band were playing and there was this like the climax of a fireworks display going on and it was really the fireworks was lighting the band. Sounds great on paper. The logistics of doing that were a nightmare. I've made a lot of music videos, and um, that was the hardest music video I ever made. What brought, brought the band through and began the, you know, the audio slave quest, uh, you know, was in part was this video shoot. It was the literal and the cinematic coming together of the four members of the band to begin this uh, great rock journey. Mark's name came up, and I remember at the time I was, I was very impressed with the, the Madonna Rain video. Not appropriate for me necessarily. But if someone could do that with that track, what could they do in my track? And well, I found out it was rotten meat. I really wanted to get back to a more visceral, simpler experience of filmmaking. The sense I got working with Mark was that it was less him being hired to do a job for me, and it was more two artists coming together, meeting at something that took it beyond what each component could have been on its own. You know, that image of the woman with the eggs balanced and spinning on her fingertips, that's actually a detail, a tiny detail from a really complicated painting by Rudolf Hausner. And I showed that painting to Trent Reznor, and he said, well, do you think she should be nude? And I said, well, yeah, if we're trying to achieve this quality of like a Jungian dream or something, you know, she should be nude. You wouldn't censor something like that in a dream. And he said, well, I think she should be nude. And I said, well, MTV's not going to show that. And he said, I don't give a fuck whether MTV will show this or not. Some people don't want to compromise. And those are the people that I enjoy collaborating with. When you walked in and saw the sets that this took place in, it, it looked fantastic. And it wasn't, well, on film it's going to look better. It looked great as it did. Everything really was done with extreme attention to detail. The idea of making this kind of archaic looking imagery to that kind of industrial pop music was a pretty weird idea at the time. We shot that on these Bell and Howell hand crank cameras and there were no video taps. I had really no exact idea of what the framing was. There was a lot of times when we opened up the camera and like the film sprang out of it like a jack-in-the-box. It, it was an intense kind of environment. You know, we got good work done, but there, it wasn't, no one had their feet up. And we, you know, sprayed condensed air in his cheeks and we put ball gags in his mouth and I chained him up on hand, real handcuffs that were cutting into his wrist. You know, I, I would become so enraptured by the image that I just left him spinning up there for like 60 seconds and Trent kind of wobbled over to a trash can in the corner and puked. But once again, it was an example of me torturing an artist in order to try to make something that I thought was going to be memorable. The monkey was not harmed. This is very important to me because I love animals. There was an ASPCA person on the set watching. Um, that species of monkey has this sort of tick where it grimaces, so when we used those pieces it looked like it was in distress, but the monkey was not hurt. The pig was harmed, obviously. The smell of this dead, rotting animal corpse just filled the whole stage almost instantly. And it was debilitating. You, you practically couldn't work, yet we had to keep working. Uh, you know, all the damage and distress on that film, I did myself. We sprayed aerosol shellac and I took a lighter and melted the film and we dragged it around in the parking lot. That idea of being like touching the film again, it was really regenerative to experience making that video. You know, you don't get the opportunity that often to be subversive to the extent that you really are going to have a kind of censorship problem with MTV. From the beginning there were some shots that got cut out, the monkey on the cross, the nudity obviously. They couldn't show my hands in bondage. We had attached a plastic crucified Jesus to the mask and MTV said, well don't cut out the shot but just erase the Jesus. They wanted the hand of their censorship to be invisible. It took it from one place in my head to 
a place setting that didn't literally define anything, but set a tone that made the song sound better to me. And I think that's an achievement. You know, it's one I've yet to recreate again. I'm really grateful for that freedom that Trent gave me at that moment. And I wouldn't have made the Jay-Z video the same way. I certainly wouldn't have made the Johnny Cash video the same way. He had wanted to do a video for Johnny for a long time, and it just had never worked out before. And after hearing the new album, he called me and he said, I have to do a video, I have to do her, and we need to make this happen. I was like virtually threatening Rick, who is now like one of my best friends. I said, I am doing a video for that track. Johnny had a little finite window of time that he could make the video at home. And Mark said, well, I'll just figure something out. Mark was concerned about, you know, if it works out that all I do is have him well lit in a chair singing the song. He said, I don't know if that's going to be enough to carry the video. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do. As we were touring the House of Cash Museum, uh, they said, you know, here's, and here's the film uh, storage room where stacks and stacks of film cans and all of Johnny's television shows and all of his films, anything that had ever been shot was in this room. But I didn't think we were going to use it. So we cut together the video using the performances of Johnny and the stuff from the House of Cash. And it was good, it was pretty good. And we said, well, well, maybe we should look at this archival stuff. Let's see what the hell we have in these boxes. And we pulled out something and loaded it up into the computer. And I think it happened to be that image of Johnny riding the train. And my editor, Robert Duffy, I literally somewhat randomly dropped it into the cut. And we got chills went up our spine. And there was something about the juxtaposition of Johnny as a young, vibrant man and Johnny towards the end of his life that was, we knew something really powerful was going on there. And I showed the video to Rick, and Rick was like, holy shit, in a good and bad way. It really upset me, and it really affected me, and I thought it was beautiful, but it was so unlike any video I'd seen before, and so extreme, that it really um, took my breath away, and not in a good way. It, it, I, I didn't know how to handle it. It was just overwhelming. I remember I was doing a session with a friend of mine, and this video shows up in the mail. And it was the beginning of the day, and the video's there, and I said, oh, let's put this in and see what it is. But I knew it was Mark, Mark's version of the video. And what I wasn't prepared for was what I saw, and it really then wasn't my song anymore. You know? And really tears welling up, kind of everyone silent, silence at the end of the video, and a lot of, wow. That video made me cry, and that's uh, not common. What threw me about Hurt was that it was like a bonfire of vanities. Um, his and Johnny Cash. It was almost too sad, but, but beautifully done. Um, I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, I'd have to see it again, I guess, but I don't really want to see it again. When I saw the video, then the song completely was goosebumps up the spine. Unbelievably powerful piece of work. Trent Reznor was born to write that song, but Johnny Cash was born to sing it and Mark Romanek was born to film it. To be able to do a piece of work that is that powerful, that rises so outside of the genre of what it is, uh, for me was phenomenal. The power of that video is something that I can barely talk about on camera. It really had a profound impact on me. The fact that in a four minute video, that level of emotion can be brought out of the viewer is incredible. I mean, if you felt that much emotion um, during a two-hour movie, it would be a, a good accomplishment. Videos aren't meant to have uh, that kind of emotional engagement. And it's like most people don't have those aspirations for a video. It's just not the agenda to move people deeply. You're really just trying to entertain them, or it's supposed to be eye candy. But to deeply move someone with a music video, that, that, you weren't, that never comes up, you know? And it wasn't our intention. 
We didn't say, wow, we're going to really move people. Um, but boy, were people moved. Away. Everything I've done with Mark has come out really great. And, and um, everything he does when I'm not involved has come out with great. And I almost see those things and I wish I did them. And, and uh, <clears throat> it's, I don't know how he does it, but it's, uh, it's amazing. He kind of went at everything like this is his life's work, you know, and this is his legacy. I think at some point I try to reach a, a level of achieving achievement, like to finish the perfect finishing. And then when I realized we never reach his level, I decided, okay, I will go and do it uh, in another way. I've met so many talented people, but with the thing about him is he's so clear about what he likes and his vision and so passionate that I love that about I love meeting people like that and working with people like that. He gets an idea and then just realizes it so to such an amazing extent. Working with Mark was like a, a one-off and and you're glad you did it because it works. Videos are most often looked at by the record company, directors, and often bands as a promotional tool, not as something that is artistically as important as the song or the live performance or something like that. Um, and clearly Mark looked at it in a different way. I think that's why his work is great, is because he does take it that seriously. I mean, music video is a, a, a medium that um, is easily cheapened, and I, I think he brings kind of a richness to all the projects that he had worked on prior to the one that he worked on with us. And indeed, he brought it to that as well. I'd be suspicious of somebody as good at such a dark art as Mark Romanek. He really, he loves it, the dedication. And he spent his money, like some of his feet, on the video. Like, it wasn't even about money for him. You know, it was just about having the best product. He was going to do whatever he fucking took to get his images down. He knew from the beginning it was going to be hard to do it all, and he wanted to do it all. And that's the way, the why, the way that he is. He took it seriously. He's like, we have this two days, and we're going to make this art, and I'm going to do everything I can, you know, with this time to use it well and to make the best piece of art that I can. He really looks deeply at who he's working with and what they're about and what the song's about. And I think that, in the end, shows up. He's at one of those high points, and I feel like he should now move directly into a feature. I feel like he should now just sort of jump from this one mountain peak right over to another mountain peak. I mean, when I grew up, there weren't really music videos the way they, there are now. So I didn't grow up admiring music video directors. I wanted to be like Roman Polanski or Stanley Kubrick or uh, Orson Welles or something. And so I've always wanted to make movies. And uh, I made the videos in an effort to, you know, learn the craft and I guess one of the reasons I want to make films is that I'd like to do my own thing now for myself.